What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Five Rounds today. We are here in downtown Toronto. John Ramdeen alongside Robin Black as we are getting set for what is promising to be one of the biggest cards in UFC history. UFC 202 going down at the T-Mobile Arena this Saturday night, the rematch between Conor McGregor and Nathan Diaz. However, later in the show, we'll be joined by Canadian mixed martial arts promoter and, uh, dare I say, pioneer yep. of mixed martial arts, Stefan Patry, who uh, has created one of the greatest mixed martial arts organizations ever in history with TKO, uh, promotion that helped spawn the careers of George St. Pierre, Mark Hominick, Sam Stout, Pat Cote, and countless others that uh, the TKO organization returning November 4th. We're going to be joined by Stefan Patry. Oh. We're going to go back to UFC 202. Uh, have you processed that? Have you processed that? Saturday night, we're going to get a chance to witness the rematch. Uh, are we going to see Nate Diaz put on a dominant performance, take out Conor McGregor because he has a full training camp? Did Conor go back to the drawing board and realize what it actually takes to beat this bigger, powerful, tougher, mental giant in Nathan Diaz? Is it what people anticipate in their mind, or are we going to get to see something completely different? Ooh, it's going to look different than last yeah. time, no doubt about that. I, it's a it's a crazy one, and this amount of time. And sort of cut you off. Do you see just multiple possibilities I with do, the way the fight will look? I do see multiple possibilities, but I see a particular approach by McGregor and John Kavanaugh. Now, the approach that they believe will win. I think I know what it is because we looked at the same evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't talked to John Kavanaugh. I followed a little bit of what he said. I followed a little but bit. But he about, responded to one of your breakdowns yeah, saying yeah, great stuff. He said it was bang on. It was just <laughs> nice. But, you know, I left out leg kicks. Uh, it's an interesting thing. You got to do a breakdown. What you want to do is give insight. You want to share, you know, uh, views and thoughts and perspectives on fighting. But it's also a television piece. So something, for example, like... Um, throw leg kicks, get some leg kicks going and how to get them going and how to use them. There's no footage of McGregor really. I think he threw one leg kick in the last number of fights, a typical Muay Thai low kick that does damage. He uses that side the kick. side kick or the oblique kick, people call it. It's a, it's a side kick or a cut kick, they, they call it in, in Taekwondo. He uses that, but he, he very little uses the, um, the uh, Muay Thai style low kick, which people then goes, well, Connor doesn't do that. Of course he does that. Every fighter does that. There's, there's no boxer who can't throw an uppercut. Now, there are boxers who throw better and worse uppercuts and faster and slower yep. and the ability to generate force different. But, but every boxer can – every elite boxer can throw an uppercut and every elite fighter can throw a low, a low kick. I mean, Conor McGregor has thrown tens of thousands in his life like every other mm -hmm. fighter has. He just hasn't – use them or seeing the opportunity to use them or believe they worked into how he was fighting before. And I think against Diaz, you want to kick his leg. Mm -hmm. I think it's one really important thing. So that wasn't in the breakdown. Uh, if I was John Kavanaugh watching it saying, hey, nice job, I wouldn't be, oh, but you forgot leg kicks. <laughs> yeah. But I, I have a feeling that's part of it. But there, there's Diaz, if you approach him and say he is this thing, well, that's exactly what I'm saying don't do about Connor. You can't say he doesn't throw leg kicks. Of course he does. At the same time, you go, Nate Diaz is this. Nate Diaz isn't that. Nate Diaz has been that most fights. But Nate Diaz can be whatever he wants to be. These guys can change the way they approach fights. McGregor's going to do that. And most people aren't thinking Diaz is, but I have a feeling he will too. And that's why it's going to be so cool. One of the ones, for example, oh, you, you know, the Diaz brothers, they're heavy on the front leg. Well, they have been. Yeah, five or six uh, uh, analysts or commentators or Jack Slack or Joe Rogan or whoever, myself, have said sometime in the last four or five years, I remember when we were first breaking down Nate Diaz, Nick Diaz versus Carlos Condit back at the old office. Yep. I said he's going to kick that guy's leg. He's heavy on the front leg. That was five yep. years, seven, six years ago. That doesn't mean it's true forever. Yeah. So people, you'll see, oh, well, Diaz is heavy on the front leg. Go watch him. Watch him now. He checks the odd kick. He's better at it than he used to be. Not, not better enough yeah, to stop RDA exactly. from doing it to him, but he's better at it because he's not a f***ing idiot. He's not sitting around while we're all analyzing him and him going, huh. Diaz is looking at himself and going, what could I change too? So 
it, it's very strange that we do that. It's like I think, Diaz has these problems, and Diaz is like. Mm-hmm. See, I think one of the reasons why I I, t- I agree with everything that you're saying, but I think people get confused because you know, as you've seen, as you've been a part of, our job is to go and try to find the truths from fighters mm-hmm. and from coaches, and to try to find the best story and what works inside of the cage. And a lot of the times, you've heard the the answer. Um, you know, your opponent does this. Or the, oh. I'm just not concerned with what they're doing, what they bring to the table. So for Connor, why would he even be looking at the fact that Nate's not checking kicks, that Nate's not doing this, that he yeah. is getting better at, the, at, at these certain areas? Or is it just like, okay, these are things that I feel that I can execute yeah. in the fight? Well, those are based on what you attribute to, to Nate Diaz being Nate Diaz. So it's like... What did we learn from the last fight? That's a bunch of information that using that information, it gives us a strategy change. The, the, what makes fights so interesting is anybody sitting around, this goes for Kavanaugh, or any of us who sit around wa- watching fights or talking about fights or, you know, Cormier shows up on Wednesday to shoot, you know, uh, UFC tonight, and he yeah. goes, oh, Nate Diaz. You know, any of us that are sitting around talking, any of us other than the two guys in there, <laughs> yeah. We're missing all kinds of information, and and that's it, it's counter it's counterintuitive to the way people break things down in everything. Donald Trump said this, and then she said that, and then the audience said this. Well, we, if all we're doing is commenting after the fact, that doesn't tell us anything. Well, Trump never said this, and <laughs> now the San Francisco 49ers always do this. Most of these nevers and alwayses yeah. are not true at all. That doesn't make for very easy bite-sized headlines and analysis and stuff like that. That is how media works, but it's the truth. People are like, this guy is a counterpuncher. This guy isn't a counterpuncher. The last two fights of his that you've watched, he counterpunched 40% of the time. Mm -hmm. He isn't a counterpuncher. Nate Diaz isn't always heavy on his fight. Isn't it important though to get get the audience, get your opponent to believe that you're something specific, yeah, yeah. and then you get to be something different? Uh, Conor McGregor never throws leg kicks. If Diaz believes that, if yeah. he really believes that, he's in trouble. Yeah. Nate Diaz is always heavy on his front leg. If Conor McGregor yeah. believes that, he's in trouble. And if somebody who bets money on fighting believes one of those things, <laughs> and they're, somehow, in they're in trouble. <laughs> These are fluid Martial artists, these are fluid sportsmen. Football teams, oh man, they, they use a running offense. The next game, though, sometimes they'll use more of something else. Yeah. These absolutes. Based on factors, yeah, that's yeah. all it is. Yes, exactly. And these absolutes are, are the, the reason that most analysis is for entertainment. Unless, and if you want to be, if you want to do more than that, you got to go further than he's a dynamic striker and he's got great takedown defense, whatever. I mean, you have to, we have to dig and we have to deal with the variables and the lack of true knowledge if you're really going to examine. Well, I mean, one of the things, you know, people would, that would say it's cut and dry right now is that. Nathan Diaz is better on the ground than Conor McGregor. We saw that in the first fight because Nathan Diaz got a jiu-jitsu move, a rear naked choke yeah. submission, despite the fact yeah. that he smashed him in the face yeah. to get yeah. that thing. Yeah. So people would think that Nathan is the better jiu-jitsu guy. Maybe if they put it on a kimono, yeah. maybe he is the guy. Yeah, maybe but he's not. Maybe he's but not. probably he is. But probably he, is. He's done it longer. But that's, con- that's one insight. Exactly. But Conor is so smart. He's an evolved martial artist. You know, he took something away from that first fight. Uh, that first loss with with Nathan Diaz. And what he did is he decided to employ a Marcelo Garcia black belt, Brazilian Mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu black belt, uh, Dylan Dennis, to help him work on his game. Now, I don't know if anybody, I I know our viewers know who Marcelo Garcia is, but if you go to Jiu-Jitsu circles and you ask them who the greatest Jiu-Jitsu fighter, player, practitioner ever in the entire game is, it will probably be Marcelo Garcia. So when you're talking about the highest level, this is a black belt under Mm -hmm. this guy, and Connor's working with him, he is going to be more prepared than he has ever been prepared in the jiu-jitsu realm. Yes. And now, and then we've got to figure out what, in what ways. So in some is 
this guy can look and go. Position, though. Wasn't that well, wouldn't yeah. Be? And uh, the Diaz brothers, here's a few things they often do. Right. Let's drill for that specific scenario. Also, just the acclimatization. It's like you're working certain things that in MMA are, are priorities. Getting back up, uh, trying to advance your position, re using a regard to heist your hip to get back to. Things that you do in mixed martial arts to get away from. He, so he's training those familiar with the high quality black belt. So there's certain certain things that he's experiencing. If you can't make it work against this guy, then we haven't got you right. good enough. We need you to work it against him. And so that's great. But at the same time, uh, I play piano like this. If I go and I bring in the world's best dueling piano guy <laughs> yeah. and I work with him for eight weeks, I'm going to still do it like this. Sure. And then he and I will duel and he'll still out <laughs> piano me. Sure. That's, that's very, very <laughs> true. But at the same time, you're not doing this, bringing in yeah. thing. No. You already have yeah. a comprehension yeah. True. True. of what's going on. Yeah. And there's some little tricks and details Absolutely. that this dueling piano guy 100%. can teach you. So yes. uh, Chase has given us the, the wrap. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I promise you we're talking more about UFC 202 and this incredible rematch main event between Nathan Diaz and Conor McGregor. Welcome back to Five Rounds today. Ram Dean and Black with you chatting about UFC 202 that goes down Saturday night in Las Vegas, Nevada. The main event, Conor McGregor, Nathan Diaz, 170 pounds. And you get the sense, you get the sense that based on what we saw in the first fight with Conor, Conor looked really good in round one. You know, just didn't, because of the heaviness of the fight, because of all these unknown factors, he just couldn't get the job done. He got, he got to leave that night with all this new knowledge. Yes, yes. Now he goes back to his team who are committed to making him not only victorious in this fight, but as the they're trying to create the best martial artist possible with this mentally strong, mm -hmm. physically gifted workhorse mm -hmm. of Conor McGregor. And because of that, because of his physical abilities, his mental abilities, and how good he looked in round one, you believe he'll be able to do that for the majority of the rounds in this in this rematch? Yeah, I I think so. But what is? I think so yeah, too. What is? But I'm not sure. Is, well, of course we're not sure. Anyone who tells you the sure is lying, uh, and that includes <laughs> Conor okay. McGregor sure. and John Kavanaugh. Okay. Or they just don't understand. There's, there's like, there is unconscious incompetence. Sure. Like, people will yell into Twitter, you know, like, you can feel how hard, you idiot, don't you know this guy has no cardio? <laughs> you don't even know what cardio yeah, is. Yeah. That endurance within a fight, the term cardio is a made up term yeah. that was, it's not cardiovascular. Yeah. So we're already starting from a place where it's not even what it is. But I think one of the reasons why is because that's what we've been taught from, from fighters in the past. They say, you know, there's still fighters that are competing at the highest level that believe that road work is the key to victory. That let's yeah. go for a couple mile run and this is, this is the thing that'll get us over the edge. And it might actually. It might. It might. Um, but... The main thing that long distance running will do will make you good at long distance running. <laughs> right. That's its main function. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason that a lot of fighters are putting back in just pure cardiovascular activity is for the recovery. Mm. So, and even uh, there'll be one or two 30 to 45 minute runs a week for, for some fighters now that are adding it back in addition to the anaerobic work. And anaerobic work is like sprint hard uphill for 30 seconds or 35 and go back down at a medium speed for 25 and sprint again. And it's just anaerobic activity. And sprint, improve your ability to recover in bursts. That's how Tyron Woodley fights. That's how, that's an element to fighting mixed martial arts. Do you have to have a specific body type? 
to fight that way, you look at Woodley, he looks like an athlete. He looks like yeah. a football player that would need to go in bursts. Where you look at a guy like Carlos Condit, he doesn't have that uh, that output. But he's still, when Condit puts together his best combinations, yeah. defends a takedown, circles out, pressures it into the cage and pushes off, that was anaerobic work. And now he'll dance around and slide, try to lower his heart rate, flush his body, gently move. It's still, okay. there's still that an- big anaerobic component. But then guys are putting back the aerobic component. 30 to 45 minutes once or twice a week even at a speed in which you could almost have a conversation because of the ability to recover even in whether in those 30 seconds that capacity there or in the one minute in between rounds so it's all valid but when you go this guy doesn't have a gas tank most of the time a lot of these terms like gas tank. Is it just old terms? Or, yes. Yes, the people very have, much. The people have taken this from boxing. This has been the the vocabulary yeah. that we've been taught through wrestling and boxing and any other combat sports that we just kind of use. Yeah. For, and takedown defense. Yeah. That's nonsensical. That's that does. There's no such thing because in 90% of wrestling uh, situations, we're not attempting a takedown. Mm-hmm. So you'll we're just see, wrestling. We're wrestling. You'll, and sometimes for to tire another guy, yeah. sometimes you get a small advantage. Sometimes they get him to engage a certain thing. And at what moment will mm-hmm. hit the elbow? There's a hundred reasons. So people, oh, well, he defended the takedown. There was no takedown. But if you don't understand wrestling, you will, you right. know, oh, there was a lot of work against the fence, but no takedowns were attempted. Okay, well, that's better. But you sound disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, There's right. a lot of amazing <laughs> fighting going on. That's fighting. That's what ha- is yeah. happening there. Uh, if, if the, uh, I think the casual fan base, they don't want to see that as fighting, though. But that's that our work job. up against the cage yeah. where it's like it looks like nothing is really going on, but two men are exerting yeah. a ridiculous amount of energy. To, I think to the casual fans, they see that as the non-fighting yeah, aspect that, in MMA. Yeah, maybe, um, but stopping you from doing things is fighting. And you, if, if a lot of people watch football, and uh, they're like, "Well, you know, there was a, a, a one-yard run was attempted, and it would stop at at the one-yard line, and then no no yards no, were gained. No yards were gained. Well, I guess that's not football." <laughs> See, I, can't, I have no idea because no, I'm, I'm sorry. I but just you don't, executed a play, and yeah, I stopped right, stop. you. That's yeah. football. Right. That's the, exactly what's going on Is it because there's history, fighting. though? I yes, think 100%. You and I, ta- I think we've talked about this in the past. The reason why people can connect to football or connect to baseball, hockey, or basketball is because we've all had a yeah. chance to play that in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the yard at school or playing with buddies in a, in a back rink. Whatever the case may be, we have a personal connection yeah. to it so we can understand it. If you've never been up in that situation, Situation where you're pushing up yeah. against somebody and they're pushing yeah. back and you don't know how physically taxing yeah. that is, you just don't know. But that, and when I talk about this sometimes, and because I still am, I still am just so passionately want people to see all this stuff. Uh, I, I sometimes people would be like, "Why are you so? Why are you criticizing me?" And I'm not criticizing the people. Like I'm not criticizing the viewer. I'm criticizing us. Yeah, for not. I'm criticizing yeah. the machine. I'm criticizing commentary and analysis. And I'm criticizing what people call journalism and its obnoxious filling of all the space with Twitter beefs and 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 who's dating who and what this guy said and what's the next title shot and and who what, what are these fake rankings and you know because none of all of that is filling up so much space that here we are 2001 when did they when did the zufa era Two, begin? 201. so that's 15 years we've filled the space with so much twitter beefs and with so much who you calling out after this and so yeah, much well it was a good fight but there was no finishes so much of this nonsense that we actually haven't even learned how to what the sport is and it's it's also a function of the sport having such incredibly exciting moments those moments are so exciting, and they and they have such a big payoff. They're the, they're so big that we fixate on them, and we. If forget. every other moment isn't as big as that, yeah. it's like they're shit yeah, moments. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's also because of the modern people and the modern attention span and when fighting kind of came out. Because I'll tell you, there's people in our, uh, people came to me today saying, you know, yeah, the main event's good, but I'm not really super stoked about this card. I'm like. 
uh, you know Anthony Johnson and Teixeira yeah. is the co-main event. Yeah. Donald Cerrone, arguably yeah. the most exciting fighter on the roster, is also yeah. on the you know card. This Tim Means guy, fights, Tim Means, right? Lorenz yeah. Larkin yeah. versus Neil yeah. Magny. You yeah. go through. There is just a boatload of reasons to love this card. Chase, giving us the wrap again. We're going to take another break. We're still talking about UFC 202, and of course, we'll be joined on the line by Stefan Patry as there will be the re- return of TKO happening in November. Welcome back to Five Rounds today. We're chatting about UFC 202 going down on Saturday night. And we're just talking about, you know, what to expect, what do fans want, what thrills the viewers of this, why they get mad, why they're so emotionally invested, and why they can't just enjoy the action or the martial arts abilities. And I think one of the reasons why is because you actually have to Put on some gloves. You have to put on some grappling shorts. You have to go get hit in the face. I don't know I, if no, that's true. You don't true. think so? Because although people play flag football a, a little bit or yeah. touch football, without they just have become been exposed to it because of the way it came out. Now I really think a part of it is that the moments of excitement. Right now, people watch three minute long clips of things, yeah. and things that were exciting or funny or interesting five years ago are not as funny or interesting. Only the first cat playing a piano is really good. <laughs> After that, it's like, oh look, there's six cats playing six pianos. Oh look, there's a, a, a hairless cat with a hat playing a piano. Like it's gotta keep elevating. But, and that's our culture. And because of that, if it's only knockouts, I mean, I, I could be totally wrong on this, but I don't think, and there, there are times where I'll freak out. Like I, usually on a Sunday morning, I'm usually hung over or tired and I'll see something It'll be like post fight analysis. And then I'll look and they'll go, well, it's kind of a lackluster card, weren't many finishes. That's not fing analysis. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know if that happens in football. Yeah. I don't know if I don't, I don't on, think it on does. Two, on Monday, people say uh, that, that, that you go out and game. they say, oh, the football games were boring. And yeah. that's somehow analysis. No, I mean, that's only people who don't like football. Might would say. look at a seven nothing football game and go, "That's boy." Well, I don't really like football, but I love like high scoring game. I love long bombs. I love long punts. <laughs> yes, and I think like, that's the, one of the reasons why I'm sort again sorry to cut you off is because when people when they view something, they can put themselves there because they've thrown a football, they've they've caught it. I remember when I first coming from a karate background when I saw one of my first UFCs and Hoist Gracie getting an arm bar. I'm like. That doesn't look like that hurts. That doesn't. It's like yeah. I, I'm not buying that yeah. until I got arm locked for but, the first but time. Now kids do play around with that kind okay. of stuff, and it's like, according to that, we'd be like, "Well, I threw a football and I've been tackled." Yeah. But I don't really understand what happens in that zero yard thing, right. so therefore it sucks. Okay. We, We've never done that. You and I have never stood in a front and tried to stop while a quarterback <laughs> runs through a thing. And, yeah. like, you know, we've never done that. But we don't suddenly go, wow, this isn't football. God. Oh, this is boring. Because somewhere along the lines, our exposure to it, again, it's not the fault of the viewer. It's the fault of the product. The, uh, and, and maybe it isn't even because maybe it's just only now, 16 years into baseball, did they go, it's a hit, it's a catch, he threw it out because now they go, oh, this kind of yeah, yeah. thing. Over time, the understanding gets deeper. A few people and a lot of people, a couple of commentators, and then all the viewers. You talk to any of the guys. We have another office here that does fantasy sports. Talk to them about football or baseball. You talk to any regular viewers of those things. They know so much more about their sports. But their sports, baseball's hundreds of years mm-hmm. old, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, so in that time, the global understanding of baseball. So maybe it isn't even the product's fault. Maybe it's just the age. Mm. Maybe at, th- at this we need more time. We need more time because anything that you call like, oh, well, this and the compartmentalization of the way it's presented. At one time, I've literally only five years ago, you'd see somebody say, you know, pop up and, and talk about fights either before or after. And they go, well, this guy's a better boxer, uh, but this guy's a better wrestler. And this guy's got 
better takedown defense and he's got takedowns. Well, if that's all we have to do is we, we've just got three things and yeah. we just say who's better. No real quantification. We'll just take two guys and arbitrarily say one's better at one thing and there we've done it. Isn't that how it started? Yeah, that is that is how it started, but it must go further. Yeah, it has now, to go further. I think a mistake is then to just make more categories. Well, he's got better volume, but he's got better accuracy. <laughs> and you can't just list attributes. It's not Dungeons and Dragons. There's an art to it. And art gets demystified. There's an art to baseball and there's an art to football and there's certainly an art to golf. But we can all understand it now. And it wasn't done by making more categories. It wasn't done by saying, well, there's now what, although baseball sure has a lot of numbers, <laughs> a lot of numbers, then people like it. But it went that direction. Uh, I think we just, we need to understand it more and we have to prioritize when you do see something that is really cool or any people out there are seeing it and they go, wow, I can't believe how beautiful this is, you gotta share it. You gotta point it out to people. You gotta, and you gotta question things, you know? And you got to see that this is an unpredictable sport and you have to love that about it. You have to love it. We're gonna take another break. When we come back, uh, more discussion about UFC 202, the entire card. Of course, the main event, Conor McGregor and Nathan Diaz, the rematch. But there is so many fights that could have title implications. More five rounds today when we come back. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. Ram Dean and Black with you. Coming up November 4th. Mark it on your calendar. It is a date that should not be missed. It is the return of TKO. We are joined on the line by the promoter, Stefan Patry, an uh, infamous promoter here in Canada, maybe around the globe. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, everybody is excited about this endeavor. TKO 36, the return of one of the greatest promotions, I think, ever in mixed martial arts. And that's not hyperbole. When you look at uh, the stable of fighters you've created, George St. Pierre, Pat Cote, Mark Hominick, uh, Sam Stout, you gave them a platform for them to go on to the next level. Uh, tell fans, tell the viewers, tell our audience, what can they expect from the return of TKO? Well, uh, the platform just got a whole lot bigger. Uh, they can expect fireworks. They can expect fighters that are going to surpass themselves because not only are they fighting on the biggest platform in Canada, they're now fighting on the biggest platform in the world with UFC Fight Pass. And, uh, you know, it's going to be exciting. It's exciting for us. I'm very excited. excited for the, exciting for the fans. But it's also very, very exciting for the fighters. You have a relationship with the UFC, but for people that don't know, how did this uh, deal with Fight Pass, how did that come about? Uh, well, as you know, I, I, you know I, have, I have a very good relationship with them for over 15 years now, ever since they bought the company in 2001. And uh, we worked on many different uh, levels. Uh, with fighters, with different things. And, uh, you know, after the, um, the fiasco, I would say, that happened with S1 and the, and the Quebec government, uh, I was there, uh, you know, I, I talked to them, you know, uh, on and off for the past couple of weeks. And uh, there was a mutual interest from us and from UFC to bring back TKO. And uh, we sat down and uh, started talking about a deal. It's been... Uh, Took a couple of weeks, obviously, with the with the sale of the UFC, it slowed things a little bit. But uh, we ended up uh, reaching an agreement where everybody's very happy. Uh, Stefan, people, you know, follow fighting in a variety of ways and on a variety of levels, but historians see TKO as a contemporary of the UFC, especially up here in Canada. Yeah. I mean, we grew up on on TKO just as much as the UFC in the early days, very much so. And uh, did you foresee it coming back? Like, you know, it, we think of TKO as a part of the history of fighting in Canada. Did you foresee this coming in and starting a new history? Well, I, honestly, Robin, I was, expecting a, I, I was expecting a buzz, but never like this. The buzz is absolutely incredible. I've given about 200 interviews since Thursday, since the the the, the, uh, the press conference. Uh, the UFC Canada office are receiving tons of requests as well. Uh, the social media buzz is simply incredible. We've sold more than 1,200 tickets in like what the five days. Uh, we're getting requests from all over the world. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't even know there was so many fighters in Canada. I mean. 
I would. Uh, I didn't count them, but I received hundreds of uh, resume from fighters wanting to fight, and uh, you know that has a lot to do with obviously the, the TKO's history, but also the opportunity to fight on, on Fight Pass. And you know, um, uh, we. I could see the difference between this announcement that TKO is back, and for example, when I launched uh, Instinct, uh, the buzz was pretty good. We had a good, you know, a good, a good run, but. Nothing compared to this. It's just, it's just crazy, and it's very exciting for us. When it comes to, I think, if people are objective and they look at uh, the TKO organization and, and your history, one thing is certain: you, you try your best to deliver fan-friendly fan fights, and you're kind of you're giving the fans the, the stars of tomorrow today. When you look at all the, the fighters that have been on your roster, multiple UFC champions, fighters that have challenged for the UFC championship. How do you find that next crop, especially now when we're, we're kind of saturated? You're, I'm sure, you're, like you mentioned, you're being, being bombarded by coaches and, and fighters from all over the world. How do you make sure that you're, you're giving the fans the product that uh, resonates the TKO brand? Well, it has been my schedule since Thursday. I've been doing interviews and sitting in my living room watching fights. Uh, every single guy Sounds that good. I receive a resume from... I just watch their fights. I want to make sure, because uh, a big part of TKO's past success has always been the matchmaking, always been the quality of the fights, the quality of the matchups, and uh, you know that's going to be that's going to be the, the job uh, coming come November fourth uh, to not only deliver uh, very good prospects but to put those prospects in fights that will matter to the fans. Uh, uh, Stefan, there's a few people that you'll have on this card, some of which it's just shocking to me were, were available that nobody understood how to use them. One of those is Chris Hordesky, one of the most exciting fighters going. Uh, you had him fighting for you in the earliest of days with the great Sean Tompkins. How weird is it that that kid was just available and waiting and needing somebody to, to give him the right fight? Well, to me, it didn't make sense. I mean, when I when, when I took the decision to start back TKO, Chris Rodecki was one of my top three priorities uh, to sign with the organization. Uh, I mean, the kid. I mean, people don't realize, but he has a great record. He's twenty-one and six. He's twenty-one and six, and uh, he's uh, you know uh, uh, he's not done by any means. He's only twenty-eight years old, mm -hmm. uh, and for him right now, he wants to make TKO. Uh, I mean, the the, the 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 buzz that TKO is creating and the, and the impact that create TKO is creating by coming back. He wants to do the exact same thing to his career, and uh, you know now he's coming back home. He's coming back to where Team Tompkins has been so successful, which is TKO, and that's how Chris feels. He feels that now he's in an, an environment where he can go back to the drawing boards and re-become the Sidney Crosby of MMA. Stefan, how do you ensure longevity? You Clearly, you've had 35 uh, events with TKO in the past. This is the 36th show. How do you make sure that there's 50 shows, that there's 100 shows? What do you have to do to ensure that you're profitable, that you're doing the right things for the fighters, dealing with the, the commission? How do you make sure? What, it, what do you need to do to make sure that this lasts? Well, um... What Instinct was missing back in 2012 was a deal like the deal we just did with, with Fight Pass. Uh, UFC Fight Pass uh, guarantees us in longevity. This deal, obviously, I don't want to go into the, the, the details sure. of the deal, but it does give us the, uh, the guarantee that uh, TKO will be there for a very, very long time. And uh, eight years is not enough for me. <laughs> I want, you know, I want to, to push this brand all the way back to the top where it was. And uh, and I, I do believe uh, that uh, you know TKO are, will become the number one show on Fight Pass, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the next GSPs, the next Conor McGregor, the next top stars are all going to come from our show, and uh, whether they're Canadians or not. But we're confident that the next big stars of the UFC are going to come from us, and I, I think the, the UFC does believe that as well.
I think uh, I hear you got the best commentary team in the business, <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> Well, apparently you guys are not all that available lately. <laughs> we'll make ourselves available if you hear anything. That's fine. <laughs> if you hear anything through the business that we're not available, we'll take vacation time just to do it. Uh, Stefan, one thing I want to ask you is, is about this venue, the Tohu. Yeah, the, the yeah. last show you were supposed to have uh, was supposed to go down at this beautiful venue. Uh, and if yep. our, our viewers have not seen it, why did you just, uh, decide to, to go into this new f- type of format? Uh... It's the most beautiful venue to, to, to launch TKO again. Uh, the first season, the first six events will all happen at the Tour. It's a beautiful venue. It's high-tech venue. It's brand new. It's a circular, so it's round, so you can see well from everywhere. It holds uh, 1,721, uh, which is a very good number for us. And uh, the atmosphere in there, the comfort, the... Uh, the, 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 the special effect, the, 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 the sound and lightning we'll be able to do in this, in this building is going to be out of this world. I mean, people have been uh, uh, used to beautiful setups with TKO, but what happens on the, when they see what's up on November 4th, they're going to be like, okay, now we're at a different level. We know Derek Goche taking on Chris Horodescu. You know, Lindsey Garbett's on the card. Uh, Remy Boussier is on the card. Uh, do you have everything set in stone? Do you have your main event? Do you have your, your main card filled out? Can you give us uh, some details of what fans will expect on November 4th? Well, we've announced three fights so far. Uh, we're obviously going to announce the whole main card, uh, I would say, by the middle of next week. So that's the top eight fights. And then there's going to be six prelims for a total of 14 bouts. Uh, we're not uh, about fight orders, uh, who's going to headline, who's not going to headline. Um, I'm very, very, very comfortable with Rodeki fighting goats in the main event. Those are two TKO veterans. Yep. Uh, but we're still working on a deal uh, that could probably become the main event, and, and Chris and Gauthier would do co-main event. So you got to tell us what that is. What are you working on? I can't, but, uh, but, but, but I think Orodek and Gauthier is very solid. The fans here are, are freaking out about this fight coming. Everybody wants to see that fight. Uh, I mean, and then we, on, we announced Robert Serres from London, fighting, uh, London, England, fighting uh, Remy Boussier, which is going to be a barn burner, two super strikers that are going to go uh, head-to-head, toe-to-toe. And then, obviously, we announced the fight between Maggie Burchell and uh, Lindsay Garbett. And then, obviously, we announced all those guys that are going to fight on the card. T.J. Laramie, uh, Jesse Ronson. uh, I mean, all the guys we announced so far are all fighting on the card. The only guy that we announced that is not fighting on the first fight, on the first card, is, uh, is, uh, what's his name, Uh, Gabriel Ovik Strenia. He's only going to fight in January. We have the Jordan brothers. We have, uh, this is going to be, I can say in advance, TKO 36 will be the best TKO in history. It is going to be a great night of mixed martial arts all going down in Montreal November 4th. It is the return of TKO, TKO 36 Resurrection. He is Stefan Patry, the promoter. Stefan, we will be very excited to work alongside you on November 4th, and we can't wait. Congratulations on all your success, and I'm sure we'll be hanging out in Montreal. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. Ram Dean and Black with the UFC 202 going down Saturday night. Conor McGregor, Nathan Diaz. But there are a slew of reasons to tune into this fight card. As I mentioned, the co-main event, Anthony Johnson, Glover Teixeira. And uh, one of the questions I want to ask you, you and I were having this discussion, our buddy Evan Boris, one of the coaches down at the Black Zillions. uh, Anthony Johnson has a whole, a lot of stuff on his plate right now, the week of Hmm. media obligations. This could be a distraction, but with a week, he's already ready to go, right? You're supposed to be ready to go week of. You're supposed to have uh, got yourself, you know, other than making the weight, which is a really ugly process. You're supposed to be sharp. You're supposed to have done your sparring. You're supposed to be mentally focused. You're supposed to have the plan together. You're supposed to have executed the few specific things you're going to do, hopefully, uh, in drills that simulate things that you're sure he's going to do, but you don't have to live and die by that. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to have done all that preparation, and uh, Anthony Johnson always does. They're all, Evan was basically saying, you know, we just want to see him 
Uh, Punchy a, kicky. Yeah. Just That's a, a performance that shows what we did because yeah. what he did, uh, he's ready and and he can win this fight. And that is the that is the Anthony Johnson style, the punchy yeah. kicky. Yeah. As a matter of yeah. fact, when I was in Las Vegas, I talked to Anthony Johnson and I asked him about learning new things. And he's like, you know, I'm just the type of guy that if my coach teaches me something and I don't get it in the first couple of times, it's not meant to be. Yeah. And uh, is that a bad thing? When you look at Anthony Johnson and the way that he has achieved success in mixed martial arts, it's by kicking you in the head, it's by punching yeah. you, it's by stalking you, yeah. it's by avoiding the takedown, yeah. Yeah. and being stronger yeah. and meaner and more yeah. more powerful. Yeah, it's true. Um, remember, you asked for you mentioned that to for us when we were in Montreal, and for us said, "Well, I make a deal with them. Uh, I say try with it professional for, fighters, yeah, try it for two weeks, yeah. and then if you don't like it." Um, uh, you don't have to use it. And for us, he's a genius uh, for a million reasons, yeah. but he's a genius in this reason, too, because most people who try something for two weeks will be better at it. And by the time they're better at it, they're oh, more interested in it. it. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I caught that guy with it. <laughs> yeah. Or I stopped that thing with it. Um, and so they'll use it. And because uh, I've had a conversation with Joe Silva a couple of times about, you know, Joe is convinced and he, he has been exposed to a lot more fights than any of us, <laughs> yeah. probably than anyone. Yeah. But he's convinced that, that there are things that you are better at learning than others. And, uh, um, Which makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. Um, but his examples for it were anecdotal. Um, Pete Spratt. Oh, Pete Spratt just couldn't learn jiu-jitsu. Well, I mean, what was the environment? Anecdotal, he, and Joe will be the first to tell you, Joe's a, uh, a, a real science, like he's committed to the scientific method. He would say, well, anecdotal evidence actually isn't enough. But it's his belief based on his exposure to these situations. And like I said, Joe Silva's been exposed to a lot <laughs> yeah. more fighters than yeah. anybody else that lives, probably. You know, and that's probably true. Uh, so, but So it's his belief that certain guys just are, will not learn certain things. My belief, my argument with him, and it's fun to debate with Joe because he's brilliant and he likes to debate and he likes to be proven wrong. He's seeking being proven wrong because that's what science minds yeah. do. They don't just st stick something in the ground and go, see, I told you, yeah. MacGruber doesn't have a, have a, <laughs> a gas tank. <laughs> They they want to be proven wrong. Yeah. They're looking for credible argument. Yes. Give me a credible yeah. argument. Yeah, and when you do, and it makes me think, and then maybe yeah. I even change my yeah, mind. Yeah. I'll I'll, uh, I'll go back on it. With There's, the goal of being right. That's what the, the end goal is. Okay, I need your yeah. information yeah. to lead yeah. me to the right answer. Yes, and the, if in a week I know the right answer because I was wrong, that's a that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah, that's how we're going to get yeah. smarter. And then a year later, we're going to gather some more information. That's what we're after. There's this idea that, that people, oh, he's a flip flopper. I want that. I want people to be flip floppers. I want to follow somebody who leads, whether we're talking politics or my coach or my boss. I want somebody who, when presented with evidence that disproves their idea, they change. And that takes us right back to McGregor. McGregor and his coach believed they had the answers for every fighter. Diaz strutted up there mm. and said, no, you don't. And I'm not surprised <laughs> you don't. They now have new questions, yeah. new evidence, new challenges, and they have to go find those answers they think they have, and that's why this fight will be interesting. Nate Diaz says, oh, you think you do? I'm willing to, to take that test, and here we are, about to watch one of the great fights ever. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're wrapping things up here on Five Rounds Today. Welcome back to the show, UFC 202 going down on Saturday. Ram Dean and Black with you. Uh, Rumble Johnson, Glover Teixeira. Teixeira um, kind of running his own camp yeah. right now. Do you find that strange? He has that relationship with American Top Team, but uh, you saw the, some of the viz of him being in Connecticut. Should you be your own general when you're going into battle? I, I, my feeling is, the, feel, the predominant feeling is that 
that can get you as good as you've ever been, but not necessarily better. So if he thinks as good as he's ever been is going to be enough to beat Anthony Johnson, he can be in shape, he knows how to fight, he can get sharp, he can bring in some specialists to teach him some tools, but but that's that's the question. Uh, a couple of th- quick fights to talk about. Donald Cerrone, Rick Story. Donald Cerrone, again, at se- uh, fighting this fight at 170 pounds. People talking about the ranks. Well, he should be in the rankings. Well, his, he got a win over Alex Oliveira at 170 pounds. Alex Oliveira dropping back there, 55ers. Alex Oliveira dropping down to fight Will Brooks at 155 pounds. Then his fight with Patrick Cote. Patrick Cote, not really a ranked guy. We know Patrick Cote is a super dangerous yeah. guy at 185 yeah. pounds, yeah. 205 pounds. That's a legit win. But this fight with Rick Story, a guy that's designed for 170 pounds, big and strong and very difficult to beat down. What do you envision? The Rick Story versus Safadine. Yeah. We didn't see Story winning that fight. No, we, we didn't. We thought Safadine, finesse. Would, finesse and skill, is is there to beat this guy. Uh, we also, uh, in talking about variables and being prepared to learn from being wrong, we didn't think Cowboy was going to be Pat. So here we are with two guys we underestimated last time, and we got to get them right or wrong. I mean, realistically... I, I'm a cowboy fan, but I, he's fighting something very unique and a real 170. So I'll go with story, but I'll be very excited to find out I'm wrong. It is another show in the books. The big event goes down this weekend, UFC 202. We got to thank our producer, Chase Kaiser. He's Robin Black. Thanks to Stefan Patry. TKO 36 goes down November 4th in Montreal. I'm John Ramdeen. We'll see you guys next week after UFC 202.